for every component that you make for every piece of functionality, just ask yourself, do I need JavaScript? Like it, if you just start with that, this, the idea of the island architecture becomes a lot simpler. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Modern Web Podcast. I'm your host, Dustin Goodman, Engineering Manager at This.Labs. Today, we're very excited to sit down to talk to James Quick. James is a full-time content creator and co-host of the Compress FM podcast. Welcome to the podcast, James. Hey, hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, James, you've been all over the place doing a lot of stuff. Your life has changed uh, <laughs> a lot this year. Um, tell us a little bit about what's kind of going on in your world, what you've been working on. We'd love to hear yeah. more. Yeah, so I guess the big thing that you kind of alluded to is we have a six-month-old now. So we had our daughter, Jamie, back in May, which has in some ways changed everything and in some ways like not changed that much. Like finding time to get stuff done is a challenge. But also I feel like we're, we're doing pretty good, my wife and I, of like figuring out that balance. So I, I work full-time for myself doing content creation. I also do a few other things, speaking at conferences and consulting. And my wife is actually in tech uh, doing events and sponsorships. So we often like overlap at events, which is a lot of fun for us. It'll be interesting to see how we balance that with um, with a baby going forward. But anyway, I, I create content. I, I do YouTube is my biggest thing. I create courses, which I'm sure we'll talk about when we get into the Astro context. And I uh, did TikTok for a while. I actually slowed down on TikTok after having the baby, just like priorities and time and, and didn't have enough to do multiple platforms and stuff. But Anyways, it's a ton of fun. The The big thing for me is it all comes from a place of loving to teach. I kind of got thrown into this world with my first job at Microsoft years ago. And I never knew that this was something that I'd be interested in. I never thought I would be a content creator. I never thought I would consider myself a teacher. But that's that's what I love. And that's what I continue to do. So I'm pretty blessed and privileged to be able to do that full time. I love that. And I love the teaching aspect, too. I mean, what a great way to spend your day like hey i love tech let me go play with something and then mm -hmm. teach people about it but uh i mean you were telling us a little, a little bit about it but like microsoft you were doing some stuff like what got you to move into the full-time content creation or content creator life rather than just kind of doing it on the side um yeah. sounds like a lot of factors there <laughs> yeah i did it i've done it on the side for a, a long time now so i started my career as a technical evangelist at microsoft in 2013 and this was my first job coming out of college again i'd never i never spoken at an event i never recorded a video i never done any of the things that i ended up doing there and i did a lot of speaking i did a lot of workshops and i started a youtube channel at the time just to have videos that people could watch when i did a workshop because instead of telling the same thing over and over again i could say go watch the video because the questions are the same and i can answer all those questions without having to like repeat myself so that was why I started. And then I created some additional video content at Microsoft and I left and did engineering and architecture at FedEx here in Memphis. And while I was there, I realized I really missed being tied to the community, going to conferences, creating content, spending way too much time on Twitter, like all the things that we we do probably. And so I wanted to, I wanted to get paid to do that. So I, I had started building that up myself again. I was doing my YouTube channel and I was like, if I'm going to do this, why not have a company pay me to do it? So I went to work at All Zero as a developer advocate, again, maintained my personal brand and, and content then, and then went to Planet Scale as a developer advocate there. And I uh, was continuing to maintain this. I was making money on the side from content, and I had always had this dream of being able to do it full time. Like what a cool, powerful story for me to be able to, to accomplish, like goal to accomplish and story for me to be able to tell people. And I wasn't quite ready. I didn't know when I would be to do that. And I got let go from uh, from Planet Scale. And so that became, ironically, like the opportunity for me to do the thing that I had been wanting to do for a long time. And I had proven to myself in the past that I could make, you know, decent money. And then the question was like, all right, if I really did this full time, how much more would I be capable of making? And the cool thing for me is this past year or this year, I will have replaced and even beyond my previous salary. So I will replace my previous salary plus more with um, with content creation, which I think is a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. So I just I've been doing this for years on the side and been doing it full time for a year and a half. Congratulations. That's a huge win for you. Um, and I think part of that journey this year has been a new course that you've written about 
Astro, I know I saw yesterday, I think it was Cap was asking you or yeah. asking about, hey, what are good resources for Astro on the internet? And everybody's like, James Quick's got this amazing <laughs> course. So why don't you tell us a little bit about like uh, what's going on with that? Like uh, what got you to do an Astro course? Are you working with Fred in them? Or is it just something that you got really passionate about all of a sudden? And we're like, I think this is the thing I should be talking about. Like what, yeah. what was the influence there? Yeah, it was, it was a lot of things. Um, so as, as a content creator, one of my goals is to diversify income. So I make a lot of income from sponsorships, which is fun. And I like working with brands, but I don't like being dependent upon sponsorships. So I wanted to di diversify that. And another goal was to do get back into doing courses and to do them on a semi regular basis, one or two a year, to get into the habit of like really nailing down what course creation is like and marketing and, and all the things. And I was trying to, to find a topic. I had rebuilt my personal site with Astro and I was thinking this is a unique enough thing that people haven't really created a, a lot of content about yet. It's something I'm pretty interested in and they're just continuing to ship like awesome features along the way. So I chose Astro and actually had um, one of my good friends, uh, Brad Gierpe, build the demo. And this was a pretty in-depth blog, the full course is a blog that is not just like static pages and stuff, but also does authentication. It uses Zeta as a database. We store comments. I'm about to add feature or uh, videos on doing emoji reactions. Like there's a lot of really deep stuff there. And we'll talk about kind of the evolution of Astro, I think in a minute. But anyway, he built the demo and then just started like chipping away at creating that into like breaking that down into individual chunks and videos and, and sections and that sort of stuff. And trying to share with people along the way what I was working on. And uh, ended up uh, very close to the end. You asked if I was working with Fred and the team. I have, I'm in a Discord channel with them, and we've had a little bit of back and forth. And one of the things was like the week before I was going to release the course, they launched Astro 3.0, which had some, some, a few individual significant changes. And so I made the decision kind of last minute to just go ahead and move everything to 3.0. So again, I would have like timing wise of, 3.0 just launched and also James just launched a course that like covers this stuff. And there wasn't that much that I had to change, but I did have it ready. I think a week after they launched, the course is ready and, and shipped and everything. And so far it's gone really well. We have a Discord uh, dedicated <clears throat> Discord channel for people where they can ask questions and stuff. Gotten lots of good feedback from individuals, feedback online, especially with the, the tweet that Kat posted about Astro content. And for that many people to, to jump in and say, James has a course, I think, is kind of a testimony to the quality, hopefully, of the course and, and the value that people are getting out of it. So anyway, it's been a ton of fun from the technology side on learning and working with Astro from thinking and putting my marketing hat on of like, how do I get this in front of people? How do I drive sales, doing a Black Friday sale, all these things. It's been a lot of fun. So I think before we get too much further, uh, for those that aren't familiar with Astro, do you mind sharing with us kind of what it is and maybe how it differs from uh other like things uh, i don't want to bury the hatchet there so <laughs> yeah so astro really made a name for itself in kind of the static site generator space right so in the javascript ecosystem I, for me gatsby was the one that really brought eyes to static sites for a while like at that time three four years ago every day somebody else posted like just just created my site with gatsby and it's great and it was so easy and blah 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 and so i went through that process as well and I was I was kind of a latecomer in, in my mind to react as a whole, because I spent a time doing a lot of angular at work and just didn't get into react, but I started to and then got into Gatsby. And then I started hearing about Next.js. And I, I pretty quickly like outside of my blog, my personal site being on Gatsby, like kind of did everything then content wise and, and demo stuff with Next.js and Next.js offered really to me the perfect combination of it can do all the static stuff, it can also do all the server side rendered stuff. Because we've gone through this wave in web development of we almost made the assumption that static was enough for everything and then quickly realized like it's just not like it's great for what it is, but we need more functionality on the back end at times and maybe yet more often than we thought we did anyway. So Next.js was that perfect combination. And to me, Gatsby kind of like fell, fell behind really. And I think they've added a lot of that functionality too, but it, it's been since people have really migrated to Next.js, I think. And anyway, Astro came out and it was just, it was really just the static part, but the stuff that they did, they just did really well. So I was in the process of migrating my personal site blog from Gatsby to Next.js, spent a lot of time in Next.js, 
but working with markdown like transforming markdown and and reading the files i was having to do way too much manual work for my liking to be honest and getting like syntax highlighting to work was a pain like it it just it felt way more difficult than it should be and so i i heard about astro in the middle of spending like several days converting to next i was just i just i just dumped everything into an astro project and it kind of just worked like it automatically parsed markdown files it automatically had code syntax it automatically did all these things and i was like i'm i'm sold on this like this specific functionality this is all i need for my site is just this stuff right here and so I just I moved away from Next.js, like from I still have probably a folder somewhere of like my site in, in Next.js not done. I moved over to Astro. And then really quickly, they started coming out with more features. So they added an image component, which is something Gatsby's done for a while. Next.js has done for a while for optimizing images. But then they started adding server stuff. And so they've been historically known for doing really just a, a fantastic user experience, developer experience around static sites and content collections, which maybe we'll talk about more. Uh, but then they added basically all the server functionality that you can need. And it's not as detailed. It's not as like far along and evolved as Next.js. But you can do basically all the things that you could do in Next.js or SvelteKit or what it, Nuxt or like whatever else you want to do. So I, I've loved the transition of them kind of moving away from just being static first, but really nailing that experience first, then moving into the server. And my bet is like they're going to continue to add features and functionality on the server but they're gonna do it with an amazing developer experience of mine because they've proven that with all the other stuff that they've already done. So anyway, I am super excited about uh, Astro as a whole. I think it's gonna continue to get better and better. I think it will more directly compete with things like Next.js the, the farther we go along. I personally built my own uh, website on Astro also doing the Next.js migration. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh yeah, let me go build some Next. And then I was like, oh man, all this uh, MDX stuff, and I had done all I had done a lot of that when I worked on the React docs, and I was like, yeah, that was super fun. But mm -hmm. like setting it up all again was like, oh, I don't want to do that. And then uh, Astro came out. I was like, everybody was talking about. It. I was like, oh, let me go check it out. Now my personal site's built with it, and mm -hmm. I, I haven't looked back. I mean, it's such a first class like personal site experience. Uh, but it's exciting to hear all this other stuff because uh, one of the things that really attracted me to Astro was I didn't have to use React. Uh, yeah. And I think you kind of touched on that a little bit, but like, I, I think it's really cool how they've been able to do this architecture where if you need to do progressive enhancement with JavaScript, like you can pull in React, you can pull in Preact, you can pull in Svelte, you can pull in Solid. Uh, I think they just pulled in Angular now that standalone components are a thing. Mm. Is that is that true? Uh, Actually, do you know? I don't, I don't know that for sure. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I think there's been... I think there's been kind of like a third party integration with it in the past. I think, don't quote me on any of this. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if it was like officially integrated now. Yeah, I'm actually gonna go look that up real quick because I'm, the the Angular Renaissance itself is just like so cool and I'd love to see it. It looks like they mm. don't have it quite yet, okay. but I wouldn't be surprised if they had yeah. it in the next six months. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think, maybe this is a, an interesting question here too is like astro because it allows for kind of all these different frameworks to get pulled in you kind of piece it together like do you have to think about building an astro site differently than you do maybe a next.js site like next.js everything's react it's top to bottom you're you're integrating with the apis that they present you astro feels like you're maybe you, you have to use astro files which maybe you're a little foreign but then also like how do i get all these other features in like uh i'm pretty sure it's called island architecture yeah. like is that a different way of thinking like do i have to think about web development differently when i'm working in astro yeah i think you can start at a pretty pretty simple level of for every component that you make for every piece of functionality just ask yourself do i need javascript like it if you just start with that this the idea of the island architecture becomes a lot simpler so one of the things we didn't say earlier is Astro by default ships no JavaScript. So all the stuff is actually done like statically or on the server if you're doing SSR. And it just ships like raw assets or whatever, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, if you have it. So I take the JavaScript back. By default, just HTML and CSS. And then you can actually just write script tags inside of an Astro component and just write vanilla JavaScript if you want. Then you also have what we'll talk about in a second that you already mentioned is bringing in other frameworks. So first question is for this stuff do i need javascript and an example of this in the blog demo that i built for my course 
is none of it uses JavaScript to start. And I'll, I'll add one caveat in a second. So we have a blog that's like an SSR server generated page for the individual blog posts. We have comments and authentication, but all that stuff handle is handled on the server. So the form for the comment just submits to the server. The server then um, saves its database and then reloads the page, kind of like your old traditional way of doing this. We're not we're less used to doing that now because we've been doing things like React for a long time. But that's the way things were done at least a long time ago. So anyway, the the update to that though is like in the course, I'm adding the emoji reactions. And for the emoji reactions, I definitely don't want like the full page to refresh. So I can add in JavaScript to be able to handle the emoji reaction, send it to an API endpoint inside of Astro on the server, get the response back, update the emoji to be uh, like a red color to show that you actually have uh, reacted to the post. And that's pretty cool because that's the only part right now that has JavaScript. So that means all the other functionality for the uh, the blog, which is pretty pretty functional, doesn't use JavaScript. No JavaScript gets shipped to the browser. So the island architecture is basically that idea of being able to pick and choose when and where and if you actually need JavaScript. So island just means the idea of like, I can have this whole big page. I have this one little section that needs JavaScript. It's going to be its own island where we'll ship JavaScript just for that. And they have different ways to load that JavaScript. Like you can uh, load it when the page loads, you can load it when it's in view. Like there's different things to optimize how and when and if you actually get that JavaScript, depending on if the user gets down that far. So to be able to do that, you can bring in a framework. And this is pretty neat. I remember hearing about this from Cassidy Williams to start, like early on before I really got into Astro and she did a demo inside of our Discord. It was like, you can use Vue and React. And I was like, that's it's neat, but why would you? But it, it starts to make more sense as you look at like, I'm just doing stuff without JavaScript until I need to, and then I just can use whatever I want. And I think that's pretty powerful. I think that is extremely extremely cool and i think it makes it so if you want to experiment with new technologies on your personal site it gives you this great opportunity to do yeah. like very little widgets here and there um but before we continue with our discussion let's take a quick moment to acknowledge our sponsor this that labs uh this that labs is a development consultancy that is trusted by top industry companies including stripe zero wikimedia docusign and twilio this dot takes a hands-on approach by providing tailored development strategies to help you approach your most pressing challenges with clarity and confidence. Whether it's bridging the gap between business and technology or modernizing legacy systems, you'll find a breadth of experience and knowledge you need. Check out how this.labs can empower your tech journey at this.co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Now, coming back to our conversation, I didn't want to take away too, too long, but like we're, we're, we're getting in kind of like the nuts and bolts of Astro a little bit. Like there's so many cool features. You mentioned a few earlier, like content collections and the image component, like uh, before we get deep into any of these and maybe all of them, like what's the most exciting kind of feature that you're seeing maybe in V3 or maybe the whole thing, like what's your favorite Astro feature that you personally use kind of when you're developing with it? Yeah. Uh, you already mentioned it and it's content collections. Content collections is, to me, by far the best experience for working with content. And content could be Markdown or MDX or whatever you want to use. And so they have a, a config file. They have a specific directory for content. Inside of there, you can define a config file. And you can use Zod schemas to determine the front matter uh, properties of each individual uh, item of content, whatever that is. So if we start with blog posts, the front matter is the, the stuff that goes at the top. And it's the... <clears throat> the name of the article, the date it's published, um, the description, the link to the image, etc. To be able to have like basically TypeScript types around that, so that when you when you import that stuff into an Astro component and you work with individual uh, posts and try to access the data, to have TypeScript around that is an absolutely incredible experience. And then to use Zod, Zod I always do this, Zod to define <laughs> those types is a is we a all really want nice offering. I know, yeah, we want Zod, not Zod. <laughs> But that's a really nice authoring experience too. So you have like not only TypeScript when you consume that content and try to work with it, you also have like uh, warnings and errors and stuff inside of your Markdown post if you don't have all the required fields. And that's really cool because you can standardize and ensure that all of your content has the right stuff. And so you can create different uh, folders for different content collections. For me, if I have blog posts versus speaking engagements or something, those can be organized separately. And there's just no extra work that I have to do with it. 
And they also have APIs built in, not only to query, like all blog posts, you can query and filter blog posts. They also give you kind of pagination stuff built in as well. So you can say like, I don't, I forget what the actual name of the function is, but like get page one of blog post, and I want it to be 10 posts and then uh, wire up a button that says go to page two and then ask it to give you page two of that. Anyway, the content collection experience for managing content is just by far the best I've seen working with content in general. I'll, I have a fun story about this. So I, I started on Astro on V1 pre content collections and I actually had built my own custom content collection feature on top of my existing Astro. And so when V2 came out and content collections came out with it, I was like, this is going to be an interesting migration. And it was actually kind of cool how seamless it was. I ended up deleting like two or three whole configuration files that I had written and all the custom code around it. And then everything just kind of worked. Yeah. And the thing that you kind of left out in there, which I thought was also really cool, is with front matter, like everything's either, well, everything's a string. But what's really cool with the Zod validation is now we also get type conversion. So I had um, mm. I had my own custom date formatter yeah. that I was using on a on a field, and then when Zod came in, it was like, oh, I have a date time object now. Yeah, I'm just going to use that. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go delete that five line function that I didn't actually need, or I needed then I don't need now. And I, I'm with you. I think content collections are just so cool. Uh, I think uh chantastics who put me onto it he, he posted right. about it like right after it came out i was like all right all right michael let me go see what this is about and then yeah. uh sure enough it's i I, agree. I couldn't agree more i think that feature is just absolutely fabulous it is yeah there's there's one additional thing going back to something you mentioned before is the integration with the image component so inside of your schema definition you can actually define something the image not just to be a string path to the public image you can actually give it a relative path into your file system of where that image is, which means <clears throat> previously I had in content, I would have blog folder and then markdown files. And then all the images for those would be in the public directory. And I could just link off to the public image path. Now you can actually define in your content schema, this is going to be an image that is going to be uh, relative to the file system of where that markdown file is. So you can host all your images or save or yeah, save, I guess, organize all of your images right next to the markdown files and then be able to pull them in as actual Astro images and not just a public image that lives in your public directory. So I think that's pretty neat too. I, I totally do that. And I think my SEO has benefited greatly from it just because now I don't have these like 10, 15 second load. I mean, they weren't 10 or 15 seconds, but two, two, three second load times on these yeah. big images. I, I, that's so huge for the mobile experience. Yeah. I think and that's just fabulous. Yeah. There wasn't a great way to optimize that. And I actually think a, a sad secret, I haven't made this update in my personal website, so it's still like not taking advantage of this. So they're probably not optimized, uh, but there just wasn't a great way to do it. And now it's just kind of given to you, which is really, really nice. Uh, nerding out for a minute. I originally did it using Vite. Uh, so when they moved from Snowpack to Vite, uh, Vite has a plugin, and so I just used that to do it myself. Oh, and it cool. was ugly because yeah. the import paths were like. It, so when I imported my images, I had to specify the dimensions at import time, so I didn't have the dynamicism mm. that the image component gives you. Kind of sad, but it is what it is. But it worked. Uh, yeah. But it worked. And then when content collections came, I was like, yeah, I'm dropping that. This is mm -hmm. so much better. Um, yep. They just they keep making it so much better every time I touch it. Uh, they have so, a really so speaking good of, feel for developer oh. experience. Um, it just, it I don't know. It, they do developer experience, I feel like, better than any other framework I've ever worked with. It's definitely one of the better ones. Mm -hmm. I... I, I I would agree that it's one of the better ones. I haven't had a chance to play with some of the more advanced features like you have, so I think it's something I'm going to have to go play with kind of after this and learn more. But um, I think talking about Astro V3 a little bit and your course, I mean, you mentioned that earlier. I, one of the big things that they did with V3 was they introduced the View Transition API, right? Um, I think it was can, slightly or was after, that? I think it was like a um, a minor update or something, yeah. Yeah, so uh, they're the first, I think their claim is they are the first framework that has actually 
provided first class support for this, but can you tell us a little bit like what is the view transition API? Why do I care about it? What, how would I use it? Like what is it doing? Like why is that so significant? Yeah. Yeah, it was actually, it, it directly addresses, and this is, again, something I haven't updated in my personal site just because I haven't gone back. So, like, don't don't judge me super hard for that. But I, one nobody's of problems, judging for that. <laughs> <laughs> one of the problems I have in my personal site is if you go from, like, if, if you do pagination and you're on page one of blog posts and you go to page two, it's doing a full, re, uh, full request to the server and a full page refresh, refresh. That means you're not able to do things like you can in other frameworks where you're, like, the header stays the same, so you're not reloading that. Um, the sidebar, if I had one, stays the same, so you're not reloading that. You don't get that optimization. And that's because uh, Astro, by default, is a multi-page uh, multi framework. Yeah. Is that right? Multi-page application? Yeah. MPA? MPA, yep. Make sure you get all my acronyms right. <laughs> so that means that every page you go to is a full page refresh. It makes a full request to the server. It sends back the full page, and it now reloads or loads that new page, and you're not able to save anything going from one to another. And that was, to me, like one noticeable downside. It was actually made me question a little bit, like if I were to do Next.js, some of these things would be more difficult, but at least the user experience wouldn't be a full p full page refresh. It they they would be able to save like all right header stays the same. Just load in the other blog post or whatever. So view transitions helps address that. And I'm not the best person to like go deep in this. So kind of take everything I say with a grain of salt as well. But at at the highest level, you're basically kind of animating in from one page to another. So I think in some ways it's still doing that full page refresh. Although I think there's a caveat to that. It's just now animating that in, so it doesn't look like you're really making a lot of changes. I think there are ways that you can tell it like to keep the nav bar the same and not change that at all. But even if you don't do that, like so it just looks so good. Like it looks like one of those really polished experiences going from one page to another that users love, like I love, and I think users in general love. There's also, again, not the best person to speak more in depth about this, but there's also the ability to maintain state across these page transitions as well, or view transitions. So you can, let's say you have a cart, for example, and you're going from different pages on an e-commerce site, and you have a cart with an icon of one in your cart. Well, you don't want to like lose that as you go from one page to another. So you can actually save that, not refresh it, but also maintain the state that's there. And that's pretty powerful. And now you're getting real close to the functionality that something like Next.js provides of the balance of server static and then being able to optimize going from page one page to another. That's actually really cool. I also remember the Spotify demo that came out right after View Transitions yeah, got exactly. announced. And it's like yep. you had the you had the state of your player that just followed mm -hmm. you around in and out. Uh I, I talk with my hands, so people are like, what is he talking about? And I'm, I'm moving not, my I'm hands. Podcast, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not the best place for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, you would see it in the bottom left-hand corner, and then, like, you would go to the the next screen, which was the album page, and that would blow up, and then you'd shrink it back down. I, I'll have to find the link, and we'll post it in the description for this, because that honestly was one of the coolest view transition demos, I think. But the the ecom one i think that's actually maybe the most significant one in my head it's like oh yeah like when i'm when i'm server rendering a page i'm like oh yeah let me make sure the cart has its state when i render the page because that's yeah. super important um and like and next i know exactly how to do that but if i was doing this on like a, a spa like mm -hmm. i wouldn't re-render my nav but right. okay i'm in mpa mode so okay i don't have the spa so i can't can't hold state that way i'm not doing server rendering necessarily so i lose that state so now, okay, how do I do it? And that sounds like a really neat way and something I want to, I think I and others will probably want to check out because that could be a really cool first class e-com experience for sure. Mm -hmm. It's definitely something I need to go a little farther, uh, deeper into. Again, I, I've kind of uh, clarified, I'm not the best person to speak in depth and like give everyone the exact details. So go do extra research. But it is really nice and to set it up is literally one line and you can wrap, uh, either not wrap, but just add the view transitions component to your root layout. And now you've got view transitions across all your different pages. And you can again, customize and do more with that. But if you just wanna see like the animated transition from one page to another on every page, one line inside of your layout and it's good to go. I love that. So um, we're kind of talking about the content uh, collections earlier, but also image component. And you kind of talked about how that's kind of a new thing 
uh, features like Next have done it. Um, I want to I want to touch on it a little more if you don't mind. Like, how how does this image component differ from kind of some of Astro's previous solutions? But also like, how does it differ from something like let's say I want to use Cloudinary or some other first class like CDN platform that's like hosting my images and I can just like proxy it. Like, how does how does that differ for me as a developer? Yeah, well, Cloudinary, and I'm a huge fan of Cloudinary. I've, I've used Cloudinary for a lot of different things. I also do some consulting with Cloudinary. Um, so anyway, I'm a huge fan of Cloudinary. And the way that works is they're a hosted service, which means you have to have an account with Cloudinary. You have to uh, push your assets up to Cloudinary. They host them, et cetera. And what they give you is the ability, mainly through query parameters, to like query an image, but in the query parameters determine... I want you to give me this specific height and uh, width. I want you to give me a specific format, or I want you to automatically give me the optimal format for this browser. And for a while, WebP images weren't supported on more browsers than Chrome, I think. So it would give you like WebP for Chrome, but it would give you something else for a browser that didn't support WebP. So it'd give you the most optimal. And then they've got tons of extra features with background removal and AI stuff and all of these really cool things. So Cloudinary is awesome. The the big difference is like you don't need a third party service in this. What we're talking about with content collections and with the image component in Astro is those images just live in your source code. So if you um, you don't have to worry about a company going away, not that I'm worried about Cloudinary going away, but I, I have complete ownership over all of my images. They're in GitHub. I guess if GitHub goes away, I'm in, in trouble. But like I have them in backup so I can go get them in, in GitHub if I make some sort of mistake or whatever. And I just have full ownership. And I've I've kind of gone back and forth with this in my personal what i think is my favorite way to do sites because there's a little bit of extra hassle of just like managing the media yourself inside of your own source code and it's a little bloated when you like pull down a repo and that sort of stuff but at the end of the day having that complete ownership is just really nice so the image component gives you similar functionality to what cloudinary could do although not as in depth but you can tell it width and height you can tell it uh, to give you an automatic format you can use picture where you have different size images based on the width of the screen, for example. And it's just all about optimizing the experience for content sites. Like images are a necessity on every site. You can't have, very rarely are you going to have a very successful site without images and media in general. And being able to optimize that is one of, or I guess the flip side of this is not optimizing that is one of the biggest things that can hurt performance, user experience, and from a sales perspective, like con conversions, right? If the site loads, slowly and you're selling something people are probably going to run away so that's something you don't want to happen and this is just all about optimizing that experience optimizing in a few different ways the format the size not loading images if they're not on the screen like there's no need to load 100 blog post images if you're if your users only going to see the first one above the fold so all those optimizations just play a big big factor in a successful user experience and people actually using enjoying and converting on your site is there any concern though for runtime performance when you're hosting your own images like that? Uh, I know in Next.js applications that I've run in the past specifically, like when I have all of my images in the image uh, component and I'm loading it, like I've had to go and re-optimize my entire image asset pipeline. Um, and, and maybe this is getting too deep into the internals, but like I know uh, in a Next one, uh, next on non-Vercel, so like on an Amplify or a um, I've done it on um, Netlify, Amplify, and a few others, but like I see like really big slowdowns on image heavy pages because it has to like runtime process all of those images and through uh, I think they use Sharp under the hood um, and like making sure those look right. Like does Astro have the same thing, or do you know if they like build time optimize? Am I, I actually, like getting way too deep on you? <laughs> no, it's a, yeah, it's a great question. I just I don't actually have the answer. So I think this is one of the differences also of working on a personal site where I have 50 blog posts and a handful of images versus working on something much bigger. And so I, I haven't hit a scale where I've honestly had to pay attention or, or care about that. Like the stuff that I have loads really good. And maybe one of the things you're, you mentioned <clears throat> is similar to, to how Cloudinary does it, where Cloudinary doesn't generate all of the images, like all the versions of your image beforehand. They wait until you request that image, then they create it, then they cache it. So then it's available from now on for anyone else that requests it. Maybe Next.js does the same thing. I don't actually know how that works with Astro. Maybe it's the same thing as well. But again, you think about like 
if one individual if an individual image is slow to load one time and it's cached then it's not going to happen again and that's still i think much more beneficial than alternatives that we might have yeah i i think it's really just that initial buffer and load because and it depends on your cache time um uh, at least with next i i i know everybody uses it so but yeah that's definitely something i was curious about and i i think you you started to kind of touch on my other kind of side of the question which is talking to content collections and kind of scaling a little bit i know you and i probably have slightly smaller websites but uh i don't know if you remember uh kent dodds a couple of years back uh he's like yeah i moved everything from gatsby to remix because my build times were 45 minutes because of all the content that i was hosting statically um is that a problem in astro has content collections found a way to like avoid that problem or is that something that like somebody who's at that scale might be running into and might still need to consider like offloading that to a database or a uh i don't know a why can't I think of the word CMS? Uh, there we go. Content management. Yeah. yeah, I was like, which acronym am I pulling for now? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure somebody's hit their bingo card by at this point in the show. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know if I have a specific answer to your question. What I think, though, is maybe more important is the approach you take to generate that content. So, regardless of where it comes from, how and when you get that content could definitely be a factor. So, if you're concerned about like build time, if you have a million blog posts and you're concerned about build times maybe you don't do it statically, right? Like you do SSR so that you have that option. One thing I don't know though, I don't know that it has the ability to do like um, statically re incremental static regeneration like Next.js does. So Next.js can do something like if I have a thousand blog posts, I can pre-render statically build 50 of the most popular ones. And then as the other ones are requested, we do SSR, but then cache that. So then it's kind of statically served from then on. I don't know that Astro has the ability to do that. But I think a lot of the details about performance just come down to making the right decision for the type of data you have and the size of data of using statically generated content, server-side rendered content, and then maybe just pulling some things in with JavaScript. So like loading <clears throat> comments, for example, you don't need to load those with a static page. So you could do a static page, but then add dynamic JavaScript on top to load comments after the fact. Uh, you can also do that optimally to say if they don't even get down to the comments, don't load that section because we don't need it. And then I think pagination is another thing that becomes important. When we, as YouTubers, do tutorials, we like rarely address the fact that like, hey, query all from the database doesn't scale, right? Like you want to you want to pay to to chunk that into things that are reasonable to be able to query and then display on a page. So I think just looking at what all your different options are for build time and rendering and pagination, all that sort of stuff. I think those are the things that become probably the most important decisions and maybe some tweaking and things to improve performance that way. But in terms of uh, incremental static regeneration, I don't think there's an option for something like that. And Astro, it'll be interesting to see if they add something like that, because that seems like a really powerful option down the line, especially when you get into a bunch of content. Sounds like we gotta send a tweet towards uh, yeah. Fred and Ben after this and be like, "Hey, we were just talking about this. Uh, maybe y'all want to get on that." Um, well, we've kind of explored a bunch of different aspects of Astro, the content collections. We've talked about the image component, the view transition API, uh, and we've talked about how it allows you to pull in some other kind of new technologies. Uh, I was just gonna ask you real quick, like because this one I think really blew my mind when I saw it the other day, is Quick finally made their integration for Astro. And now it's part of the, uh, I'm going to call it a family, because we have a family of libraries we support now and packages. But like, by any chance, did you see that announcement the other day? And like, how do you feel about a uh, versus kind of a um, Astro component where you have to use the directives to determine whether or not, or you have to use their directives to say when something will load in quick can just be there without any of those directives. Yeah, I, I have seen it. I've also seen a little bit of uh, presentation about um, quick in the past at uh, all things open in North Carolina. I think one of the challenges is for people to really understand how quick works. And, and I say that because I don't fully understand how quick works. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> There's lots of promises, and I'm not I'm not saying I'm skeptical of the promise. I'm not saying the promise isn't real. But there's lots of promises about what you're saying about resumability and not shipping JavaScript unless it's needed and all these intentional 
educated decisions about when and where to load the JavaScript and how to do it the most optimal way compared to any other framework that's ever been created. And again, I'm not saying that that stuff's not real. I'm just saying that from my perspective, it's hard to understand that. And so I, I, I don't have my mind wrapped around quick enough, ironically, my last name quick, to be able to make an educated decision of, does this make sense for me? Is it something that really changes the game for me? But from what I under, from what I do understand, the performance and the decisions, as you said, that it can make of when and how and where to do JavaScript and to bring in resumability, I think there's a lot of promise and excitement about that. I think there's just a lot of, there's just more time for adoption for people to understand its value and how it's how it works. Because I am in theory or in general skeptical of things that promise a lot because everything markets really well, right? Like every time mm -hmm. Next.js have a, has a conference, it's got the best of everything. And they have a lot of great things, right? But there's also certain things you need to understand like trade-offs and, and there's things you have to learn along with that. So I just don't know enough about it to really make that decision uh, for myself. So anyway, we'll see. Um, I, I know people that have tried Quick are really excited about it. The Quick team is obviously very excited about it. To have that integrated into Astro is definitely a plus from a performance perspective because that's the thing that Astro started with first is like not just zero JavaScript, but zero JavaScript until you need it for the benefit of performance. And that's also something that Quick is obviously very um, intentional about and very far along with, I think. So uh, anyway, we'll see. We'll see what that turns out to look like. Do you think that... This is also maybe opening a door for Astro to be kind of the, uh, I don't want to call it the experimental playground, but like the playground where, you know, frameworks that are up and coming really like want to show their stuff. Like it's a good place to really prove it. Like quick maybe hasn't had as big a takeoff as maybe they wanted, but like they have these really cool promises yeah. and we're still wrapping our head around it. But like once you see it inside of something you're more familiar with, maybe that's the moment it'll click. And same with maybe other things like solid and yeah. maybe other very popular frameworks like Angular and Vue might have a resurgence within uh, the Astro kind of ethos, so to speak. Do you think that's a possibility on the horizon? I, I don't really. Like, I, I definitely get the idea of being able to tap into a brand and, and something that has so much positivity around it. I, I One, I don't think Astro is, is that big. Like, we sometimes I have to take a step back and differentiate from what I see on Twitter and what like the, the the entirety of the developer ecosystem is using and as excited as I am about Astro as excited as I see other people. <coughs> it's just not that popular when you compare it to things that are like react right like it's nowhere near anything like that so it's very far down in terms of usage. It'll continue to grow I think it's hard when you look at Astro and its main use cases of like content websites the need for JavaScript in general becomes less. And then it's it's not it's not the kind of thing I see for myself of like, I've got this little bit of JavaScript, I'm gonna experiment with something new. I would kind of not conflate, rather not conflate them. Like if I wanted to specifically try out quick, I'd probably just go and do like a quick app and do it that way. So for me, I don't really see it. I could I definitely get the idea of like attaching to a brand that that's pretty successful, gaining traction, positivity, all that sort of stuff, but I don't. I don't, I don't see that being like a game changer for companies that want to get, um, find a bigger market to, to get exposure for their products. I think that opens a, a great question to maybe round out this conversation because we started with how you're a content creator and you went full time on that and now how like trends and things impact kind of your decision, how your ecosystem on Twitter and on different social media are maybe different than what other people are saying. Like how does social media and what's happening and maybe like tech Twitter influence what you're doing as a content creator. Yeah, it has a big influence on what I do, but, but I don't write production software. Like, I think that's something really interesting for people to think about with content creators. Most of them aren't writing code 40 hours a week and they're not working on production level software, right? Like I have my website, I have demos, I have the blog for the course. I have, I have things and I'm, I'm a pretty good developer, I think, but I also am just not the person who's working at a company 40 hours a week writing code. And the reality is like, I'm super big into JavaScript. JavaScript is very popular, but also so is .NET, so is Java. So we're all these different things that people use on a regular basis. So I think we get this biased perspective of what people are interested in, of what people are using, et cetera. I think we look at content creators as if the things that they try out that they're excited about are the things that everyone should go and do. And the reality is they shouldn't, right? Like. We just don't move that quickly, especially at companies, even for personal projects when we're just working on it an hour a week or something for our personal websites. 
So I think I think we should all keep in mind that what we see on social media is not a representation of the ecosystem as a whole. Sorry, I have to cough. You're good. <laughs> Please I don't get sick more, of us. <laughs> I, I've already been sick and I've am struggling with it way more than I thought I would. So I apologize. Oh no, it's okay. We appreciate yeah. you being here. Thanks. Um, so it's, I think we all have to keep in mind, it's not a great representation of kind of what the real world looks like, but it is fun to be part of the hype, but I do get to make intentional decisions based on things that I see on social media that I think people will find interesting and respond to as well. And also do timely things. So when next JS updates something, I can go and create content on that. Cause that's what people are interested in. Um, so just something to think about, like, it's not, I don't know the the real world, like especially if you're breaking into tech, the real world stuff that you might use in your first job is probably not Next.js. It's almost definitely not Astro. Like it's it's things that go that have been around for a lot longer, that are not necessarily stable because these things aren't stable, but just been around and trusted for a longer time. But you'll continue to see more and more adoption of of these things as we go along. It just takes time. James, I love your perspective and love your energy. And thank you for coming on the show. I'm sorry you're not feeling well, uh, but uh, I hope you feel better soon. Um, I think before we we walk away from today's episode, I'd love to hear kind of where can people find you on the internet? Uh, where should we continue conversations with you? What are you working on next? Like what's next for James? Yeah, there's there's a little bit of a pun in there. I haven't <sighs> said this yet, but I, I am going to be working on a next JS course. So doing... Next.js 14, server actions, all those things. I'm excited about that. I'm kind of building in public now, working with a few brands and Next.js. So I'll, I'll be creating content about that. But I am James Q Quick on everything Twitter, um, I don't wear TikTok, although I haven't done TikTok in a while, YouTube. And I also run a Discord community called Learn, Build, Teach. So if people are interested in an, a Discord community for people that are interested in web development and a safe space to kind of ask questions and share that sort of stuff. Um, that's where I usually send people to. So learnbuildteach.com. I love that. Well, before we go, uh, let's thank our sponsors one more time. Uh, <laughs> approach your most pressing tech challenges with confidence, leveraging this.lab's tailored development strategies. Trusted by giants like Meta, Google, and T-Mobile, they specialize in bridging business and technology gaps, modernizing legacy systems, and ensuring sustainable application architecture. Discover how this.labs can empower your organization at this.co. That's T H I S D O T dot co. James, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I look forward to checking out more of your Astro content. I'm very excited about your next course uh, as you build out in public on that. And uh, everybody should join James' Discord community because he's an awesome guy and there are just awesome people around him. So, Definitely join the party, join the conversation, and let's build some awesome stuff together. Thanks for hope having you me. you all enjoyed this. Of course. We hope you all enjoyed this episode. <laughs> See you all next time. <laughs>